Okay, good afternoon. And my goal today is to make you productive even during transitions toward best practices. And I will specifically refer to DevOps. Okay, that's, that's me. But I would like to tell you a brief story, which is the one that inspired my chapter. So a few years ago, I was involved into a project. And when I came in, I see that there was the front-end team. They were testing their work against some kind of fake API. And the backend team, they were just manually invoking their API. And they didn't even run integration tests. And then there was the pipeline. But the pipeline wasn't effective in catching all the problems. So the result of this was that every time the testing department got the new version of the application, they basically got a blank screen, which is the application broken. OK, when I came in, I started to say to the front end team, so why don't you get the latest version of the back end, of the real back end, on your workstation? And test some of your workflow against the real back end. So they, they said to me, but we don't have any automated test that does it. Yes, but this is because nobody in the company can do it now. So please start to test them manually. Can you believe it? <laughs> manually. So when I went to the second team, which was the backend one, and the, then I said to them, well, get the latest version, please, of the front-end part, and do some testing with the front-end part, in integration with the real one. They said to me, but this is the responsibility of the pipeline. OK, but I agree with this. But the problem is the pipeline is not measured still not measure, it's, it's not complete. So when I asked them to do some more validation, even if manual in the, on their workstation, things got better. And why is this happening? Well, this is happening because companies do not always have best practices in place. This is a reality. And why, why is this? This is because, for example, maybe a company doesn't believe in best practices. Or maybe they just don't understand in depth the best practices I itself. Anyway, the truth is that moving an entire company towards the, implement the implementation of a best practice is something that is it's a big challenge, and it takes time. In the meanwhile, we, have, we all have a choice. And the choice is between just, I don't care. So basically, it's business as usual. Someone in the company will take care. Or the other choice is, uh, I want to be involved in improving the process even if we are during the transition. And of course, this presentation is about this second choice. OK, that's the picture. The picture is, in my experience, what I've seen, a disconnection between the development team and the DevOps team. And you may think that it's not your case. I think that you are thinking this. But I will try to demonstrate that maybe it applies to you also. 
So let's introduce some actors here. This is CI CD, which is continuous integration and continuous delivery. What is continuous integration? Well, continuous integration is a practice that was born in order to have validations, automated validations, in a controlled integration environment. And then it has been extended with continuous delivery with more and more steps in, in the pipeline towards production. And in that time, they, they came containers, pods, and a lot of more or less complicated stuff, and we get a little bit lost with automations. And my, one of my point is that I think that we got a little bit obsessed with automations. The other actor here, DevOps. DevOps was born in order to break the silos between the development team and the operation team. DevOps is not a mechanical practice. It's more like a culture, actually. It's the, a culture in which development people and operation people work together in the same team with the same pace. And this is the problem. And they named it the ownership shift, and I will explain why. This is because this is when the development team delegates validations to the pipeline. But the problem is that the pipeline is now owned by the DevOps team. This is because, of course, the DevOps is conceived as a team, not a, as, a bad pra as a best practice. The DevOps team doesn't really know the structure and the validation needed by, by the software they are delivering. And this is because of this disconnection. And the, there's sometimes, for example, if I want to, and this is a real example, I want to uh, integrate my JMeter tests into the pipeline, so I raise a ticket to the DevOps department, and after two weeks, the DevOps guy calls me and says to me, why should I do that? And we just lost two weeks. And this is happening. I am seeing it. And this is a pipeline under these circumstances. What's, what's going on here is that bugs, of course, are introduced during the development phase. Few bugs are detected by the first steps of the pipeline, and this is because the pipeline is not completed, and a huge amount of bugs are detected in, during testing. And this is a huge problem. Because, because bugs cost exponentially more as time passes. So let's say that I find a bug in my local machine during the development. It's normally quite easy to fix it. So maybe let's say that it costs like $10. If that bug goes to production, and we discover it into production, it may be cost $10,000. $10,000. Because if you get the bug, for example, during testing in the QA phase, you have also to involve the QA team. They will raise a ticket and the ticket will go back and forth with the development team. So there's kind of a round trip. And the ticket has to be prioritized also. So other teams are involved. But when the bug goes to production, there's also the support team involved. And you have the risk of damaging 
your brand reputation. So, well, I, I will propose a, a couple of solutions to this painful situation. And the first one are private builds. Private builds are, is not a new concept. It was introduced in the continuous integration book. Private builds are simply those validation steps that you take before you share your changes with the rest of the team. So before you integrate. And metrics, well, I will, I will explain three metrics that I, I have chosen. And they have to be used combined, because combined will spot if you have a problem of this disconnection, where the problem is, and a hint on how to fix it. Private builds. Private builds is simply that command line that you run on your local machine that runs all the tests. And that's it, basically. But let's clarify a little bit because private builds may be automated or manual. Or, or a mix of them. Of, of course, the concept is that they should be automated, fully automated, but manual is, is something awful that we have to step behind 10 years or more to manual testing stuff in your machine. I know that it's hard, it's awful, it's terrible, but remember that we are during a transition. We are in a situation that maybe we should take some validation step manually, at least provisionally. Private builds can be, I use personal or mob. I use the word private and not personal because personal refers to just one person. And I know that you are doing maybe pair programming mob programming, and if not, you should. And uh, private builds also, I, I also, I always speak of a local environment, it's not really needed that it's local environment. It can be a remote environment dedicated for, for the testing of one developer or, or a group of developers. The important point is that Private build should be run before you integrate the changes. This is the concept. So it, it's not important where, it's more important when. And this is the same pipeline as before with private builds in place and, and implemented. Okay, in the local machine, or in the dedicated remote environment is where you normally introduce bugs, but they also are code there. Even integration bugs are code there. So even if the pipeline is still incomplete, we, we, we catch the vast majority of the bugs in the first step. And fewer and fewer bugs get to the testing phase. And this is a huge saving of time, money, and headaches. Metrics, I will explain you three of them. As I said, they have to be used combined. One metric alone doesn't, doesn't say too much. So this is more like a combined methodology than just separated matrix. And the, the first one is this one, which is time to feedback. I put it like qualitative because it's very difficult to measure it exactly. And uh, it, it depends really on, 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 the, 
on the companies and on the different realities. This is a metric which is like kind of black box. This metric will give you, when high, when the time to feedback is high, will give you a message in which something is going wrong. But the metric alone will not say where you are failing. For example, this metric may be high because of the disconnection problem, the ownership shift I spoke before about. But also, it may be just that you have a Q&A department which is not that proficient in giving you fast feedback. Maybe just because you have too much bureaucracy. So when it's, uh, it's high, it's a sign that something is wrong. But it's per se, it's not something that you can see with just this metric. And uh, sorry. And uh, how to capture it? Well, as I said, it's uh, a qualitative metric. So it's not an exact capturing, but the idea is to measure the time between you you publish your changes and an issue is detected and reported related to those changes. This is the second metric. It's evitable integration issues. And, uh, okay, to explain this, I have to introduce the concept of barrier. So we all have barrier while developing I have one barrier here, which is my local or dedicated environment. And I have a second barrier, which is the shared pipeline. And then we have the third barrier, which is the, the, testing, the testing phase. If my first barrier is leaking, maybe just because I'm not validating on my local machine, I'm just don't caring about validation. And the second barrier is also leaking because we have that disconnection between the development team and the DevOps one. Then a lot of messy things arise to the third barrier. And this is exactly what we are measuring using this metric. The quantity of messy things that arise to the third barrier. So, I will suggest you how to capture this metric, because it's quite difficult. But all of us, I think, uh, we have regular retrospective meetings. And uh, what I'm suggesting to you is to sit down with the rest of the team and classify the bug we had during the iteration. Ask yourself, was this, this bug avoidable, simply avoidable, but by, in some way, using or improving an existing private build? And maybe a second question is, if the test that should reproduce, expose the bug, is easily auto automatable? So at the end of the, the session, you will have a list of classified bugs. And uh, this metric is just the number of the bugs classified like evitable by private builds. OK. What's the meaning of a high number of evitable issues? Well, as we said, we have two barriers that are leaking. So there is no or insufficient validation in your private environment, and there is no or insufficient validation into the pipeline. This is the third metric. It's maybe the most difficult one to explain, so I will use an example. Let, let's say that someone of you and I are in the same team. And let's say this, that someone of you is don't caring about validation. You just 
commit and push some problems and you don't avoid them by validating it on your local machine by running the private builds. So when I pull your changes, the application on my machine is broken and I have to debug to see what's happening and I have to fix it. And this is time that I spend cleaning the trunk. So how could we ever capture this kind of time? Well, what I'm suggesting is that with your favorite ticketing tool, you just create a special kind of ticket, which is time spent restoring the trunk stability. And if, for, for example, if I spent four hours fixing the, the problem you put into the code, well, I, I point four hours here. And these are the three metrics. So let's check some a few examples of how the metrics works together. So, uh, okay, some examples. Let's say that we have a high time to feedback, high evitable issues, and low time to trend stability. Okay, what's happening there? Do you know? Do we have any idea? Okay, this is the most classical scenario when I see the, this kind of disconnection between the development team and the DevOps teams. And it is when developers are not running any validation because they delegate, delegate them to the pipeline. And so a high number of evitable issues are leaking to the third barrier. And, and the Q&A department is overwhelmed by evitable issues. And that's why the time to feedback raises. This is the classical scenario. The indication here, of course, is start to use private builds or improve them. OK, this is the second scenario we have. High time to feedback, low, low evitable integration issues, low time to trans stability. Any idea of what's going on here? Sorry? Well, the, I think that here, here the, the, okay, you should maybe take into account other metri uh, more metrics, but basically with just this information, you know that the team is pretty disciplined in running private builds because the, there are no evitable issues reaching the third barrier. And the high time to feedback is due to an, an inefficiency, inefficiency proper of Q&A and proper of the company. So in this case, in this case, the company should take some action on, not on the development team, which is disciplined, but on, on the rest of the teams. Basically, in this situation, the team is compensating the, the transitions problems with private builds. Low evitable, inter evitable integration and high to time to transitability. Okay, this is not a bad scenario because this is indicating that someone, at least someone in the team, is cleaning all the time the problem of the rest of the team. It's still a waste of time. It, w it should be evitable if everyone in the team r were running uh, the private builds. But but it's not a bad situation because at the end, 
integration issues, uh, evitable integration issues are low. So basically, this means that there's some cleaning boy into the team. And uh, as I, I'm quite used to be the, that cleaning boy, so I think that I'm the less productive member of the team because I'm <laughs> cleaning the work all the time. So, okay, these are, were just three examples. There are a lot of combinations. Actually, if you calculate them, there are basically eight combinations with the matrix. And, uh, well, I, I suggest you to, to try to think about all the combinations I did, and it's it's uh, kind of mm, okay. It's kind of funny, <laughs> and uh, but uh, those that I presented were the three typical cases that I see over and over again. So let's do some kind of recap here. So we've been through the problem of being into a, a transition towards best, best practices. That implies time, time during which you are in the transition. DevOps is thought as a team and it should not be. It should be thought as a culture. And this provokes that there's that disconnection between the development team and the rest of the teams, which is what I call ownership shift. Because remind that this is when the development team just delegates validation to automations that they don't own. That's the problem. So the solutions, metrics to assess and to follow up also and private build to definitely restore the ownership to the development team. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Christian. We have a lot of online questions, so let's start. Um, the first one, how can I run a local build uh, if that involves some enterprise infrastructure, for example, Amazon uh, Web Services, Azure, etc. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you should have, of course. Well, we, we are entering the the world of testing here. <laughs> I explicitly didn't want to sp speak about testing because it's a huge topic. Anyway, uh, there are this, the option of. Always there are fakes, mocks, and so on. Actually, the, the important part is to choose what to test exactly. Where are the boundaries in which you test? Because if you own just, like, just for example, this is a real consideration I had in one project. If, you own, if your team owns just one microservice, you don't, always, you don't have to test everything. You just test your microservices and uh, the integration with the rest of the microservices. But, but just, the, 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 just the step toward the other microservices. I hope I answered the question. Um, how private builds can prevent reducing bugs promoted to production? Finally, would it not detect the same issues that the automated build run in the CI pipeline? Yeah. This is another question about testing. I, uh, I mean, originally, private builds and the shared builds were the same thing. When continuous integration was born, you, have, you had the same command line in your local machine and on the continuous integration server. Now it's not that way, but maybe we should find a command, a command line that catches bugs enough. It's not, I'm not asking to, I mean, I, I, to be clear, I'm not asking to 
run an exhaustive test suite in, in the local machine. I'm just asking to validate something. Validate something that, that doesn't make the blank screen. Okay, next one. Um, all right, just a second. So with the time spent to stabilize the trunk metric, yeah. can this be used to imply that multiple developers are working on the same code similar to measuring merge conflicts? Well, I am implying a common trunk in which at the end of the process, the changes we will be merged. Yes, it, it, a little bit. It depends on 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 uh, which kind of branching strategy you use. But I think that uh, mm, at the end, uh, the point is, I mean, if I if I'm not validating my branch and I'm using a long living branch which is something that is wrong. You shouldn't do it. But in this case, I, I should continuously integrate into my branch the work of the others and validate it before I uh, merge it to the trunk. Mm -hmm. uh, which relationship have private builds with the pipeline? With the pipeline? With the pipeline. Yeah, OK. This is very good. As, as I said, as I said, in the past, private builds and the shared builds were basically the same thing in different environment. We should tend to have something similar. Um, how would you implement the time to feedback metric for each push? Yeah, that's why. I mean, I didn't get into into the metric in depth, because it's a difficult metric. What I'm suggesting here, as a first step, as a first iteration, I think my metrics will be improved with the, with the experience and with time. But as a, as a first approximation, what I'm suggesting is to, to recollect the feedback from, from, the, from the team, the, I mean, the feeling the team has. Like, they are always testing our stuff, like, two weeks later, and this, this is long, this is not a proper time to feedback. So it's, uh, that's because I put this metric as qualitative. In, re in reality, it's not, but for what uh, we are doing here, I think that a qualitative metric is sufficient. Uh, OK. Um you talk about a development team, DevOps team, and QA teams. Uh, it is not better to have a Scrum team with the developers, um, uh, specialists, DevOps, um, yeah, with DevOps uh, knowledge, so one team to build, test, and release? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, w what I'm talking about is, is, is exactly the opposite. But the problem is that I see, what I see in my experience is very often, the opposite. I mean, the big companies, typically, they, they have their, their own DevOps team. And the DevOps team has his, his own ticketing part, ticketing flow. And, and what, I, what I'm seeing is not that kind of interdisciplinary team. The, the, part, the important part for me is that I mean, you, be, you build it, you deploy it. This is, this is the famous sentence. So the pipeline is owned by the team. If I want to add a new test in the pipeline, I don't have barriers to do it. Maybe because I have in my team one DevOps, or maybe because we do it in pair programming with the DevOps of my team. This is the ideal world. This is the best practice in place. What I'm speaking about is about the transition towards that model. OK. Um, with a shared command line, uh, you can generate, for example, a full Docker environment or connect to a VPN to connect um, to, a to a protected uh, API. 
uh, oh, it's the manual test uh, corner case? Yes. 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 Yeah, well, ideally it should be. What I'm saying here, uh, man manually is, is bad because we all know because the, the reason why manual test is bad. But my point is if you don't have any other option, it's better to do it manually, at, at least provisionally, than to do nothing. And what I'm seeing that is that there's no culture of manual testing in, uh, in the local environment. And if you, don't, if you can't validate things in your private environment, bugs will go through the pipeline and will end up in testing or in production. So it's, I mean, it's, it's like a hassle to, to, to have to test manually stuff. But it costs less than the $10,000 of a bug in production. Let's hope that it's temporary. OK, could we just use uh, Git prehook to run tests locally for preventing breaking the trunk? Yes, it's a good idea. I used it. The problem is the option minus E that bypass the Git hook. <laughs> Uh, have you considered uh, canary releases, service in production, but real user traffic uh, does not reach it instead of private builds? I didn't understand the question. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat it? the question. Have you considered canary releases, in brackets, service in production, but real user traffic does not reach it uh, instead of private builds? Yes. Okay. Um, I see. Let's say that uh, this is a very good way of getting feedback, but it's not the feedback we, we need for avoiding the blank screen in testing. I mean, this is another kind of feedback, and the time to feedback is, is quite large if, when compared with the feedback you may have in your local machine. This is another kind of feedback for me. It's not the same, I mean, it's not the same. Okay, private builds. How is this relevant to the quality of the architecture? <laughs> but, okay, it's an, an indirect relationship in the sense that when the process is a mess, and th th this is actually, uh, when I started to write the, the chapter, I explicitly said that which is when you have a mess in the process, you don't have the time to think to the architecture. You are basically all the time fixing problems and, and getting tickets from Q&A or from productions. Okay, next one. I mean, this, this, I'm sorry, this is not, these are not architectural metric in the sense of statical architectural metric or in the sense of having to evaluate the quality, the quality attributes of a system. These are, are process metrics. Um, you are speaking about DevOps. Uh, what do you think about the next iteration, as, uh, S -R -E -S. S -R -E -F? Okay, um, S-R-E-F? Yes. Okay, I'm afraid it's not my field. I will, Maybe well, I didn't the, pronounce the, the, it correctly, sorry. S-R-E? S-R-E? Okay, um, uh, note down, please, the, the, the email I will, I will okay. answer. Um, <clears throat> sorry, site reliability engineering. Ah, okay. Mm, yeah, they, they, they come a little bit later in the process. Uh, may, maybe, maybe we should... Uh, Actually, it can be in some way th thought about, thought like uh, a flavor of, of DevOps in the sense that these kind of teams should also um, advise the team on how to introduce proactively observability, supportability, and all this kind of stuff. DevOps is not just automating the pipeline and, and bringing the container to production. It's something more. It should have the, 
the DevOps person inside the team should have a more active profile on the operational part. Okay. Um, did I understand you right? The main idea of the talk is just to run tests before pushing to master? Yes, but uh, okay, good question. Because if you run the tests, but as I always see, unit and mean integration tests are normally not enough to ensure that there's not the blank screen. And that's the problem, because the blank screen is because, for example, you're returning a null from an, an, an API, and that null is not checked by the front-end part, and, uh, and then the JavaScript will, will throw an handle exception. And I mean, they, they are, the, the problems I'm referring to are not cached just by running unit or mini integration tests. That's why I'm asking a little bit of more effort. The, uh, it's not necessarily manual. I mean, it's just to, the manual part, the manual step is the first step. Then you automate it. Okay, how does this relate to the four key metrics presented by Sonia yesterday? Okay, I have to confess that, ah, okay, you know, I, okay. The Dora metrics, metrics that were um, Dora metrics, I think. Uh, accelerate. Uh, okay, very good question. Uh, they are totally unrelated because I conceive Dora metrics like operation metrics, even if they measure in some way the the development throughput. But it's a measure like a, taking the development team like a, bla a black box. And uh, here we are on the opposite. Here we are opening the box of the development team and closing the box of how, how they get to production. So they are, I mean, they are operational metrics, operation metrics, and these are development metrics. <laughs>